Today, we're starting a four-week series based off of one word, based off of one verse. So I have a question for you. What makes you want to follow someone? What makes you want to follow someone? Think of a coach. Think of a teacher. Think of a minister that made a huge difference in your life, perhaps growing up. What inspired you to say, I want to be like him or her when I grow up? What makes you want to follow? But I think people nowadays, for the most part, and I'm generalizing, are a little fellowship hesitant. And I understand why. People can be, we can be skeptical, can't we? We can be disillusioned whenever a leader falls into um, perhaps moral failure as we're, you can't help but watch the news and there goes another, there goes another. And so it can be disillusioning to follow, except on social media. Technology, I believe, has changed a lot of things for you and I. Technology has changed the way we shop. Technology has changed the way we go to church. It's changed a lot of things. So I got on the internet because that's where you find the truth, right? And um, I asked, I went to um, this one website and it said, how many followers do people have with, in, with Twitter? With Twitter, let me say, and I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know, I'm just a twit. Okay, so here we go the number of followers that people have. You can imagine all the names that flood your mind and flood your heart of people who have all these followers. Um, their names like Ellen DeGeneres, 78 million followers. Taylor Swift, 85 million. Rihanna, 93 million. And the top three are Justin Bieber with 106 million followers. Katy Perry with 107 million followers. And the number one person followed, according to this website, is Barack Obama with 108, I heard that laugh, 108 million followers. But can I say something? I don't know if that's so much following as we like the information, we like that, but sometimes I think it's more like stalking. Following is so different. Following someone takes time, it takes commitment and it takes sacrifice. So today, I want to ask you, how are you doing at following Jesus? How are you doing today at following Jesus? Like I said, we're starting a four-week series today, Follow. Here's the verse. Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I want to challenge you with a few things and here's some things to ponder and to think about today. Jesus does not call you and I to admire him. Although that's a very good thing, and it's the right thing to do. This is what Jesus calls us to, to deny ourselves, to sacrifice, and to follow him, and to follow him. Many Christians cheer him on from afar, and yet he wants you and I to have complete devotion to him. I think of this passage the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, think of an athlete and devotion and commitment they must have to the sport that they are involved in. He says competitors go into training, but not only training, strict training, and they get a temporary crown. But no, not we. We do it to get a crown that will never be taken away. We don't run like 
a runner aimlessly. We don't box like we're beating the air. We are purposeful. I think some choose to follow Jesus sometimes for different reasons. What was your decision? And what led you to follow Jesus? I can't help but think of John chapter 6. You can turn there if you want. We'll be talking about it just briefly. But Jesus was at the height of his ministry in John chapter 6. Large crowds were following him. But verse 2 says why? They wanted the spectacle. They wanted the lights. They wanted the camera, the action. They wanted the show. He was popular. He was performing miracles. Later on in the passage in John chapter 6, he says, you come to me because you want your fill. You got a full belly. You're good. I'm going to turn there because I think this is powerful. And Don mentioned this in communion. And it made me think of this passage in John chapter 6. Jesus said he was the bread of life. And then Jesus said this. Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. This is verse 30, um, 53, rather. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father... So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna, manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. What? What? I remember being in Bible college and my professor said one of the saddest verses in all the Bible is John 6, verse 66, which says this, From this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. I looked at the scriptures um, several times this week and I found it interesting whenever the biggest crowds were coming to Jesus and following him, he said some of the most difficult things. I wonder if it's not about the spectacle. It's not about the show. It's about following Jesus. See, if you and I want to be good leaders for Jesus, we need to be faithful followers of Jesus. If you want to be a good leader for Jesus, you must faithfully follow. And I want to say this. If you're a completely committed follower of Christ, it will affect everything in your life. No, none of us are perfect. Only Jesus is. But it will affect everything in your life and in my life. Think about it. Will it affect your heart? What you're passionate about? It should. How about your hands? What you do? It should. I know we all have to work, go to work. This is not a guilt trip I'm throwing on you. But you know, this is what he calls us to. How about your feet? Where you go? There's some places before you met Christ you might have gone to and it sure has affected your decisions now, where you're going to go and where you're going to spend your time. How about this? Your finances. Should it affect your finances and how you give? I was talking to a friend earlier today about his heart to share as the holidays come up. And um, man, we're blessed by God to be a blessing to others in every way. It'll affect your finances. It will affect your most precious commodity. Your time. Your time. You'll want to give time. As time is allowed to be entrusted to you, you'll want to spend some time making a difference for Christ. It will affect every single thing about your life. A good friend and I were talking not too long ago, and he kind of helped inspire the direction of this message. And he said this, Play the gospel. The good news of Jesus is deeper than we can imagine. I put that on the screen. Deeper than you and I can possibly imagine. And I believe that. Deeper than you and I can imagine. I love the story of the students that were in 
their um, Bible college professor's class, and they asked this great theologian after class one day, Professor, tell us, what is the greatest, most impactful God thought that's ever come across your mind and ever come across your, your heart? And he said this. Next slide, please. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him they wouldn't perish but they'd have eternal life wow it is deeper than you and I can possibly imagine one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is Romans chapter 5 verse 8 but God demonstrates he shows his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, separated from God, doing the opposite of what God wanted us to do, He sent His Son to die for you and I. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is deeper than we can possibly imagine. I have this verse, and I, this passage rather, and... I'm reading um, mostly out of the New International Version, but I wanted to read this out of the New Living Translation because I think it's a little picturesque, if you will. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. I'm going to read this, and then you tell me, is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, deeper than we can imagine? What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since He did not spare even His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, won't He also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for His own? No one. For God Himself has given us right standing with Himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And He is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. I'm a note taker. And one of the reasons I printed this off is because I, not that you could see it from there, but I circled the for us in that first section. Who's for us? God. Who's for us? Jesus, who died for us. Jesus, who was raised for us. Jesus, who pleads for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, Neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all crea creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The good news, the gospel of Jesus is deeper than we can possibly imagine. But, as I brought this up to my friend, I think there's something you should know. It is wider than you and I can fathom. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is wider than we can possibly fathom. And I struggle with this a tiny bit, some. God is teaching me so much. But the longer I've been a Christian, I became a follower of Jesus at 16 years of age, it's easy at times to slip into the slippery slope of being pharisaical. The gospel of Jesus Christ is wider than you and I can possibly fathom. Here are a couple questions. And I want you to think about these. Is anyone beyond the reach of God? 
is anyone beyond the reach of God? Is there anyone beyond the reach of the love of Christ? Is there anyone that is beyond the reach of the love of Christ? That perhaps is too far gone? I didn't listen to this band, but um, I was a rocker at one time. Well, I'm still a little bit of a rocker. But this one um, lead singer of this band from the 80s, and actually they were... Um, going back into the 70s, and they were pretty hardcore. But in a documentary before his death, he died of cancer, he was asked the question about um, knowing God. And this guy said, because I saw the documentary, he said, I'm too old, and I've done way too many bad things to ever be saved. And he died. Is anyone beyond the reach of God? Bless you. Jesus was a rabbi. We know this. And every rabbi had students. Those usually not good enough would end up doing like a family trade, like fishing. The application process would have been tough for a student or disciple of the rabbi. The rabbi would quiz the student and say, um, recite a book in the Torah, or um, recite this one Old Testament prophet, or how many times does the name of the Lord appear in Leviticus chapter 11? These are the type of questions they would ask. How would you do? This would have been an intense process. If a rabbi would just let anyone in, it would be clear that he was not a very sought after teacher. But this is important for you and I to know. Because the excellence of the student reflects the excellence of the teacher. And Jesus changed everything. His students, his disciples, his followers were fishermen, tax collectors, and sinners. The not good enoughs. The ones sometimes that had a bad reputation. One of his followers, you know this guy, Paul is attributed to about 50% of what we now know as the New Testament. He said this in Galatians chapter 3, and I think this would have probably rocked a lot of people's minds. Before the coming of this faith, what faith? It's the faith in Christ. He talked about that in the two verses prior to that. We were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian. I love what one translation says, our schoolmaster. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that is, this faith has come, we are no longer under, under a guardian. Verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This would have been big. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. And we know culturally speaking, this would have been a big deal. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Think about that. Wrap your head around that. The gospel is wider than you and I can fathom. I can't help but think of a commercial and I tried to find it so I could get a better reference but I believe it was a commercial because I miss Michael Jordan I do I know he's still around somewhere but I miss watching this guy play to me in my humble opinion he was the greatest basketball player to ever play the game in this commercial I believe it was that he walked into a gym and they were going to play pickup ball and there were some obviously some very good players. But then there's Michael Jordan. It always helps to have Michael Jordan on your basketball team, let me tell you. He walks up to this one kid who is not good enough to be out with those other guys that seem to have it all together on the basketball court. And Michael Jordan picks the kid. Because he said, I would rather have somebody that has heart and desire than somebody with all the talent in the world. 
See, when Jesus said anyone, people began to understand that he meant everyone. Everyone. Everyone is invited. I have some questions for you, and I really want you to think about it. And it might be some things that you typically might not hear on a Sunday morning in this context. But I want you and I to think. Is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, big enough for one that has sexual past? Is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, big enough that it's big enough to save someone that has a, a, a history when it comes to their sexuality? John chapter 8 you can read it. It's not found in the earliest manuscripts, but I love that story, and I can envision it. I saw um, the Mel Gibson movie, um, which is slipping my mind now. Um, but you know what? The woman caught in the very act of adultery, and Jesus loving that person. I, some of you know this story, but years ago, we went to Dallas on an inner city mission trip to Dallas. I can still remember this like it was yesterday. And Jim Elam, the missionary in South Dallas was outside of the church and the, this church is in the hood um, just to let you know it's not too far from the cotton bowl and it's um, at night I wouldn't want to be there as a matter of fact we left every day um, before it got um, dark but I was at the front of the church and Jim Elam was out there and he was talking to somebody and he hugged her and he held hands with her and prayed with her and whenever he hugged her, I thought, I thought to myself, man, somebody might see you. She's a prostitute. Guess what? Somebody did see him. Jesus did. As he prayed for her and he comforted her and he reassured her of the love that God has for, for her. Can you imagine? What that felt like. Is the gospel big enough for one that has had sexual past? Absolutely. Is it big enough for the ex-con? Somebody that's, for whatever reason, they were incarcerated. Is he big enough? Is the gospel big enough for him, for her? Absolutely. Is the gospel big enough for one in prison? I remember I have had the opportunity to do some prison ministry at different times. And I went into, I believe it was Jefferson City. And I think it was a state maybe it was federal, and I went through lockdown procedures, and they asked me, I was going in with the ministry, and they asked me to lead worship that day. Who asked me to lead worship? Well, that's painful enough. Maybe they wanted them to suffer some more. But you know what? I went in there, and I experienced something that day. I experienced freedom. Because here are these guys in this lockdown, lockdown room, and they are singing, and they're worshiping, and they were free. And it made me think of the words of Jesus out of John 8, verse 36, I believe, believe it is. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, big enough for the legalist, for the divorced, for the single, for the alcoholic, for the pothead, for the hypocrite? Jesus is for anyone and everyone knowing Him. Christ's love compels us. Friends, that is not just good news. That is great news. But you and I need to know something. There's a little P.S. to the story. Anyone means everything. 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 Jesus wants all of you and I not just a part. We must understand when Jesus said anyone, he meant everyone, but everyone must give up everything. This is a passage of scripture um, that I'm going to put on the screen that intrigues me. And I'm going to turn to it because I want to read to you the verse before and the verse prior to this. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Large crowds, large crowds once again, were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate 
father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Friends, this is not about your mom and dad. This is about you and Jesus. See, when a student was accepted into the rabbi's school, they would leave everything. They would leave homes, their jobs, whatever was holding them back from being a completely devoted follower of the rabbi. And they would follow the rabbi wherever they went. So I have a question for you. Would you stand, please? I'm going to ask Winston to come up. Here's the question. And I would like every single one of you of every single age in this room and those who might watch it online later, what is holding you back from being a completely committed follower of Jesus? What is holding you back? Lay it down. A friend of mine was telling me about his sister not too long ago. said, you know what? I take things to the foot of the cross of, of Christ and I let it go, but my problem is I pick it back up. Let it go. I'm going to pray. And I would encourage you, if you have a decision of any kind, first and foremost, accepting Christ and making Him the Lord or the boss of your life is first and foremost. I'm thrilled that the last couple weeks we've had a baptism on both those Sundays and, and, and new families are coming. I, would, I just, we're thrilled about this. But we are not going to let go and we're not going to step back from the gospel message and being the hands and feet of Jesus and telling people, you know what, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. That's what the Bible says. Maybe you haven't taken that first step. We would encourage you to come up. Joe and LaVon Quickle are over here. And if you want a confidential prayer request, we want to honor that. But we encourage you to make that known so we can pray for you. Because we believe prayer is powerful and effective. Maybe the Lord kind of um, gave you an elbow today. Maybe the Spirit did. I would just encourage you, if, if Jesus gives you an elbow, do what He says. It's always best that way. And um, if, you need a prayer, um, if you need prayer support or encouragement in whatever decision you make, we encourage you to come as we sing. I'm going to pray first. Father, thank you so much for the words today. God, we think of that verse, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. God, help us to do that. We struggle with that. But we want to live for Jesus. Be a completely devoted follower. So Father, if there's anything that's holding us back, God, we want to lay it at the foot of the cross now. God, I pray that your spirit would move mightily. In Jesus' name we pray. You're a good, good Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are.